Okay, so, so I've actually got two subjects that I was given. Um, the first is, and I'm going to move quite quickly through the slides, and the first was to talk about some of the mega fires or large fires, I don't like the phrase mega fires, the large fires that we've had, and then to talk a little bit about some of the methodologies that we've been implementing in rural landscapes in South Africa. And I've forgotten which one it is. Let's see, there we go. But before I do that, I know you're all firefighters, and as I said, I'm a generalist and a practitioner. I'm going to ask you to have a look at this first, because in, I look a lot at policy. And uh, the latest IPPC report that has just come out now is going to promote, uh, it's looking at four scenarios in order to reduce the effects of climate change and try and keep it to a minimum of 1.5 degrees increase. And what they are going to be promoting and what we've already heard is massive afforestation. Now, if we have a problem now, and they are going to, we are going to plant a lot more forests and a lot more biofuels and a, a lot more agricultural landscape, then where is that going to take us in the next 20 years? And if we can't deal with the problem now, how are we going to deal with the problem of even more forests? And then there's also the CO2 fertilization effect. I haven't heard it mentioned today, but we are seeing it happening in Africa. And I'm sure it's happening everywhere. So I wonder how we're going to interact as a firefighting community of practice. How are we interacting with the IPPC on this? Okay, so we're talking about lessons learned in great fires. Um, but mine is definitely going to be a socio-ecology focus because that's what we do in Landworks. This is South Africa. Um, it's the fire danger rating map of South Africa. Uh, the, the white holes in the middle are other countries. So, you see up there and here. These are not big lakes. These are countries contained within South Africa. The green part is mostly desert and semi-desert, which is why it is um, not so many fires. We have two far seasons in South Africa. In the northern parts where it's mostly red, um, it's savanna. In the bottom section below the green is the area that uh, we live, uh, Dean and myself, because I brought a colleague from South Africa with me, which is Mediterranean. So it is exactly the same kind of landscape, uh, fuels and weathers that you have right across the Mediterranean regions here. And this is part of the cooperation between Paul Costa Foundation and the CRAF and uh, other countries that we are trying to develop because we believe that it's going to be international cooperation is going to be so, so critical in the time ahead. We, we cannot do it as single countries. Um, just to back up, there is the map of fire incidents. Uh, Africa burns a lot. And um, you could, it's clearly illustrated on this map. So just, I'm just going to touch on, on three big fires that for me were what we would say in English seminal moments of learning and then what we changed from there on. Uh, the, the first big fire that we had that affected the wildland urban interface was in January 2000. Actually, it was 1999 as well, but January 2000 uh, was a very big year because we had a fire on the Cape Peninsula, which is where we have the city of Cape Town. It's the same as having a big fire around Barcelona. And two things flowed from that. The first was that the, there was a creation of an awareness campaign, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But the other thing was that there was a ministerial report put together uh, that really looked at what needed to happen across the country. And it came up with 76 recommendations. And I've just pulled out the top five there. If I look now, we're almost 20 years after that fire, we have actually implemented a lot of those 76 recommendations to improve We've also gone very wrong on some, 
But the top five that, uh, that I've pulled out was the definite need to apply incident command system. We copied the American system and adapted it for South Africa. The other was that we really didn't have any nationally well-coordinated firefighting, wildland firefighting source. And most of our firefighting was really done by structural firefighters and it wasn't suitable for the kind of incidents that we were having. The other thing that we have in South Africa promulgated in 1998 is the National Felt and Forest Fire Act. Now, I could actually do a whole presentation just on that piece of legislation because it is quite unusual. And the reason why it is unusual is that it puts the responsibility for a fire starting or spreading from any land on the it is the, the obligation of the land user or land holder to do something about it, not any government structure. And I think we're one of the only countries in the world to have that piece of legislation. And it has been such a good piece of legislation. Um, this uh, report also pointed out the value of it and the system that we have um, for land owners and land users to work together. It also pulled out the need for fuel reduction, invasive vegetation. We have lots of Australian vegetation types that have come and invaded the landscape. At the same time, after this fire, there was another thing that happened that was really, really good. And that was a, a campaign. It was for four years only, and it was a multi-stakeholder campaign and it really looked at the urban edge. And what was good about it was that it brought the insurance companies, one big insurance, our biggest insurance company, put a lot of money behind it, and also one of our biggest media companies that does the daily newspapers behind it, as well as um, WWF. And uh, it really focused on multi-stakeholder involvement and educating the public just for that Cape Peninsula, and it made a lot of difference in that area. And this is just a, an example, one of the things that we did back in 2000 in that specific area, working as a group of stakeholders, was to look at all the risks and then put a management plan, an action plan in place of how we were going to reduce those risks. And it really um, did work very well. There were some other things that flowed from that. Uh, the, the one was the inception of the Working on Fire program. So this was the basis upon which the, the review had said there was a definite need for uh, a national firefighting source that could be moved around because we have these two fire seasons and we could then share the resources. And that the, by the end of the Okavoka campaign, the original concept for working on fire had already been conceived and government was starting to put the basics of the funding into it. One of the big faults with the Okavoka campaign was that it was, it was agile and it was very innovative. That was our role. But many of the innovations were then not adopted by government organisations. So a lot of the learnings were actually lost. So something to be aware of. Something that happened in between was um, that we had the beginnings of a global environment facility project called the Fenbos Fire, only for this Mediterranean region. And it looked at the beginnings of starting to move people from this suppression mindset to proactive pro landscape planning. The next event that sticks in my mind is the fire storm that we had in July 2007. And it, it was weather driven and it was taking place mostly in the areas in the north, in the savannas, where we have uh, most of our commercial forestry plantations. And uh, 
At the end of the day, um, it involves three, I don't know the size, but it was huge. And it involves three provinces of the whole country. And there were some key lessons learned from that. By then, we had already started institutionalizing the ICS. And what that incident proved to us was the true value of ICS and the ability to scale that ICS process up to meet any kind of scale of incident because you can just expand it. And it really, really worked very well. Um, also, the issue of unified command, you have multiple stakeholders, you're working across three provinces of the country, um, many, many stakeholders. This idea of unified command really worked very well. And, and the third was we had started working on fire. It was already well instituted at that point. And we had, I think, about 50 teams, mostly ground plus air, distributed across the country. So, but they were all trained in exactly the same way. And that was really, really good because they could all react the same way. They all understood the same structures and, and that became a very key lesson. What we weren't pre prepared for was the media frenzy. Um, I remember, because I was getting, I was quite involved in the media side of things, I had 200 phone calls in four hours on my phone, messages. They were just, in the end, the, the, I just couldn't cope with it. And um, it was what we were releasing to the media. The, the, the media frenzy was, and it's much more now, because now those days, 2007, Social media wasn't really such a big thing. I would uh, hate to think what the social media frenzy would be like now. The other thing, and we've seen this in subsequent fires, and that's why I put it down here, was we were really unprepared for the level of donations and the influx of donations and the willingness of volunteers to come and assist. And this is a huge missed opportunity. Um, so I think we need to get better at that. If we are looking ahead at having more big events, then somehow we need to also be finding a, a good strategy and a, a, a framework in order to work with, with donors and volunteers. The same thing happened in the next incident that um, we had, lost opportunity. So now we're starting to talk about integrated fire management. We ori originally raised this in Seville when we were um, in the World Forestry Conference that was there. And we're supposed to be looking at a whole spectrum of different things. And I'm going to come back to this slide and, uh, later because I believe we are failing at implementing what we are talking about when we talk about integrated fire management. And, and the whole spectrum of activities that must happen under integrated fire management. The next big incident was the Nasna fire. And I was saying to Mark earlier, that in retrospect now, uh, looking at what happened here, it may well have been one of these uh, paranimbulous, is that what they're called, events. So we're going to go back and we're going to try and pull the data so that he can analyze it. This was probably one of the worst fires that we'd ever had, 2017. There were nine people died. 1,400 homes lost. Um, the majority of those were good homes. There were, there were about 300 that would be the equivalent of um, a favela. But by far the majority were large homes. And of those large homes, more than 50% were not insured. So you can imagine the social impact that that had. We could not deal with the mass evacuations. There were no winds on this fire. We really, um, we, it really wasn't handled very well uh, because we had never seen anything of this kind of scale. And the restoration that is happening afterwards is um, incredible. We, we have spent millions on slope Mobile, uh, stabilization, uh, the removal of massive infestations of invasive plants coming up, that if we don't remove them, it's just going to increase the fuel load back to what it was before. And at the present moment, as we're standing here, we have a, the, what we're calling the George fire. It's a complex, it's a, actually a complex of fires. And we're at 100 
thousand hectares, and it's still burning right now. And we've already lost eight people, so we're still not doing it right. So now I'm going to change focus a little bit. These were some of the lessons that were learned from the Nasna fire. Um, and the big one was that commercial forestry was right next to a wildland urban edge. And the result of that was catastrophic. And we're not doing anything about the fuels around people's homes. The picture in the corner is a dung beetle um, on his ball of dung. I don't know how the translators are going. The translators have been fantastic, but I don't know how they're going to manage this one. So some of the problems that we have in the firefighting community is that they see themselves as kings, not queens, kings of their kingdom. And they're often not willing to come together as a community of practice and work in a situation together. So that is one problem. And here we see this little dung beetle. He's the king of that dung ball, and he's going to hold on to it no matter what. But the other thing is, and, and I'm so pleased that you've just brought it up, because I don't feel alone now as a woman standing up here. But we have to move from this situation where firefighters promote them. They don't promote themselves. They are heroes. We know that you're all heroes. But the more that that hype is pushed, the more we are disempowering communities and making them feel like helpless victims. And we can't carry on like that. We have to empower communities and people to actually be able to do things to help themselves. So, and, and it comes back on you as well, because the more the firefighting community is seen as being the heroes, the more the communities are expecting you to save them. And so we have to change this message big time um, if we're going to move forward. That picture down the bottom there, I'll just briefly talk on, because for us it was quite a groundbreaking win. Um, during that Nasna fire, which was huge, the fire was jumping, spotting kilometers ahead because the winds were so strong. We had, as part of the work that Landworks does, we work very closely with the Firewise Concepts and the NFPA. And this community is a small community where we had been working with the community there to empower them to do things for themselves around um, landscape management and, and also education within the community. That Nisner fire approached that community. You, there's a little arrow there you can see. It approached the community. The fire split. It went around, came back together and it carried on burning right the way through to the next town. And that, for us, was a real win in proving that you can do things. What we had done there, we hadn't just educated, but we'd also reduced the fuel all around that village. And um, it definitely, they did have to evacuate around a little bit for smoke, but it definitely saved that community. And I believe we must be doing this. Otherwise, we're going to lose the war. So at the moment, this is where I'm seeing integrated fire management, and not just in South Africa, I'm seeing it all over the world, because I move around quite a bit. 80% of the effort is going on detection and suppression. 1% of effort is maybe going on rehabilitation, but the rest is spread, there's no real stakeholder engagement, there's very little risk assessment, and then doing something about the risk assessment. And there's very little prevention work going on. And I believe this is our biggest problem. There's just too much emphasis on suppression. This is where I think it should be. 80% of the effort should be on that first section, which is covering risk. Stakeholder engagement, which takes time. And um, continual effort, because you have to build trust in the communities that you're working in. Most of the effort goes in going into planning, prevention, fuel reduction, community education. If we did that, 
then hopefully we would only be spending 15% of the effort on suppression and detection. And I believe this is where we have to move to going forward. Okay, I'm going to change base now and say, this is the kind of landscape that we do a lot of work. Um, we have, over the last 10 years, built up four kinds of models, depending on the affluence of the people that we're working with, and also the level of risk. And the reason why we have these four different models is because some of the communities that we work in are very, very poor. They often have no fire service to help them. They, in fact, in most cases, they have to depend on themselves and to, to actually do something. And people die. If you look at the statistics, a lot of people die from fires in South Africa. So I'm not going to go through all of these. I'm happy to talk to any about it afterwards, but we, we have a, a, vol a completely voluntary initiative. Um, but then we also take it right through to a community works program where the government actually pays a stipend for work to be done in terms of fuel reduction and ecosystem service um, and stuff like that. So these are some of our objectives under Firewise. It actually teaches people to live with fire, encourages people to take action now to prevent losses and moves this mindset from being afraid of fire which we keep promoting. Being afraid of fire to you, being able to live with fire in a safe way. And I should probably say that the majority of our people use fire on a daily basis. That some of them, most of them don't have electricity. They do burn with wood and, and they cook with wood and they keep themselves warm with wood. Therefore, there are fires all the time. So some of the lessons that we've learned around working with communities Simplify the risk and hazard process. It does not have to be complicated. In fact, that top picture, that's them, that's the local community actually preparing their fire management plan. Very visual. They draw it out. They decide where the risks are. They know their weather. They know their local conditions. And they know their topography. And they know where their fires come from. And therefore, they, they can help themselves. Um, build social cohesion, trust, respect traditional practice. And the big thing is that there must be a tangible benefit for people in some way. If you're going to engage uh, communities in making a difference within their own community, then there has to be a tangible difference. And fuel reduction, where it will lead to improved grazing, better water flow, um, better grazing, these are tangible benefits. You can also go on to do some of the things that we've done using government funds, where we have put in place uh, programs, employment programs, so we have 500, almost 600 people that work for Landworks, and they get paid a small amount of money, and they pay work part-time, but then they go and do fuel reduction work. So if there is a, the possibility of that kind of program, I believe that this is something that we could be looking at in other parts of the world. I don't think this is something just for develop, developing nations. I think this is something that we should be looking at in other places. The big thing, are, these people are wearing uniforms. You can see the yellow. They are not firefighters, ever. They are fire prevention workers. And it creates a whole different paradigm shift in a community where you have these kind of people working all the time in the community. And, you know, um, this aspect of social ecology or working with communities, it's not command and control. It's actually the complete opposite. You have to hand over control to the community. So it's quite difficult for uh, for you as a firefighting community to move out of the sphere of command and control. Yet if you really are sincere about wanting to engage communities in uh, self-help projects, then, then you really do need to let them design in a way their own projects and, and help and guide them as people that have the technical knowledge. 
And I think that's... Thank you very much.